Good morning and welcome to our diocesan worship on this, the third Sunday of Easter. Today we hear again how Jesus comes to us as risen Lord and meets us where we are. Please know of my continued prayers for you and all the members of our diocese as we struggle and move forward through this time of staying safer at home. We're planning to have on our Pentecost service a diocesan virtual choir and we hope that many of you will lend your voices to that. Please watch the E! News for more information. We continue our celebration of this holy season as we proclaim, Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord, the Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose most blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of the bread, open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter, and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 persons were added. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. As Father, the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him, you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. 
Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now on that same day, two of Jesus' disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who is a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But he had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. Amen. 
I'm sure that you've noticed by now that we don't have any icons in the sanctuary around our altar. This is what the old hermit said to me as he pointed out the bare white walls in the room. And actually, I had not noticed this until he pointed it out. But it immediately struck me as really odd. <laughs> After all, the rest of the property, it was beautifully adorned. Just outside of the chapel building, there was a lush garden. And even at the entrance of the chapel building, there were icons of Mary, the Trinity, Jesus, and other saints all over the place, along with other various pieces of abstract artwork. I mean, these hermits, they had art just to celebrate beauty for beauty's sake. <laughs> even their dining hall had some of the most splendid paintings that I have ever seen. And yet, yet, <laughs> there were no icons at all in the inner sanctuary of the chapel, this designated space of worship for the community. Do you know why this is? The hermit asked me. I shook my head. Uh, I didn't know, <laughs> and I was not about to venture a guess. You see, I usually find that self-awareness is a terribly, terribly elusive thing for me, but I had enough of it on that day and in that moment to know that I was standing in the presence of a truly holy and wise person, and that any answer that I would have responded with would have sounded just really um, dumb <laughs> compared to the explanation that he was going to offer to me. And as it turns out, I was right. We don't have any icons in here, he said, because you are an icon of Jesus to us. And every person who visits this place is Christ to us. These are the types of icons that we prefer to surround our altar with, living icons of Jesus. It was a beautiful vision. You see, the altar was right in the middle of a round-shaped sanctuary, right smack dab in the center of the room itself. And the hermits and all of the guests would circle around the altar during the liturgy. So during the Eucharist, you couldn't look at the altar without also seeing several other people, these living icons of Jesus in your line of sight. Now on that day, as my conversation with the hermit was coming to an end, to ensure that I got his point, he breathed deeply and he turned to me and said with a smile beaming across his face, once you see Christ anywhere, you begin to see Christ everywhere. That conversation was a major turning point for my own journey. From that point on, Christ would not let me contain his presence to certain limited sectors of my life. Christ's presence seemed to spill out into every sphere of my everything. And all of life suddenly became animated with a sort of mysterious sacramentality. I began to see Jesus in places where I had never seen him before, where I had been blinded to him before. That old hermit was right. Once you begin contemplating Christ's presence anywhere, you start to see Christ everywhere, even in those places that you would least expect to find him, even in those places that might seemingly seem totally desolate of his presence, even within yourself. Was this not the case with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus? I mean, the very last thing they expected that day was that the Christ would reappear to them. And initially, these two disciples even ridiculed this unknown stranger as he came across their path and as he inquired as to what they were talking about. Luke shares with us that we, the readers, that we know something about this part of the story that the disciples don't that this stranger is actually the risen Jesus Christ. But there was something about his resurrected state that had obscured who he was to them. Come on, guy, they, they basically say, what's the matter with you? Were you born yesterday or something? Our Messiah has been murdered and his body has gone missing. Basically, basically, life is a raging dumpster fire for us right now. Thanks for asking. That's what we're talking about. But while still veiled to them, Jesus pushes back and he starts to tell them 
how the scriptures had pointed to this very situation all along. That the Messiah had to suffer and enter into glory in this way. And later on, as the disciples recalled the moment, as they looked back on it, they said that Jesus had opened the scriptures to them. And the encounter was so profound that they said that their hearts began to burn with passion within them. Jesus was teaching them to wake up to how present he had been to the people's narrative all along. That there was no duality between their story and his story. Once you began to see Christ anywhere. Yet even after this heartwarming Bible study on the go, the disciples, they don't get it. They still cannot see that the one they are interacting with is the very one that they're mourning the loss of. But then comes both the climax and the most mysterious part of this whole story this morning. When they all get to the place where they'll be staying for the night, they sit down for the evening meal. Luke tells us that Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened. And then they recognized him. And then he vanished from their sight. What? <laughs> I mean, the moment is filled with so much irony. These guys finally recognize Jesus for who he is, but the very moment of recognition is also the exact moment of his departure. It seems cruel, does it not? I mean, these disciples, they had expressed earlier how saddened they were that their Jesus was gone. But as it turns out, maybe he's not really that gone, or maybe he is. <laughs> Which is it? I mean, what's going on with this story? Where did Jesus go? And why did he have to vanish? Did he remember in the moment that he had double booked himself or something? And then he needed to be back in Jerusalem and that's why he jetted out? Did he intuit that back there in Jerusalem, some of his other disciples had started to watch the Tiger King or something without him? Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age unless I'm binge watching Netflix, then maybe not so much. <laughs> Perhaps there's more to this so-called disappearance than meets the eye. One of the mystics of our tradition has said that the question of where is Jesus, it's the wrong sort of question to be asking. They say that to search for Jesus is like a fish in the ocean searching for water or a bird at flight searching for air. The whole point is that we have this tendency to blind ourselves to the divine presence that we're constantly and already fully immersed in. The secret, I think, to understanding this road to Emmaus story is seeing that the Christ did not go anywhere, but that in that moment, the disciples realized that the Christ was everywhere. The disciples could no longer see Christ because once you're in Christ, and once Christ is in you, there's nothing left to see. It's only after Christ vanishes before their very eyes that the disciples on the road, they get it. That there is no longer any duality between who they are and Christ's presence in the world. And this is why they didn't mourn his absence as before, after he vanishes. And this disappearance, they sensed no loss, only tremendous gain. And then they ran to tell the others that Jesus was risen indeed and that the Christ presence was still with all of them. My friends, this message, this reality, it hasn't changed in the slightest, regardless of how often we tend to convince ourselves otherwise. Believing that our sinfulness, believing that our brokenness even believing that our inability to see, believing that these sorts of things can actually keep Christ from us. As a result, we live our lives trying to cover the difference rather than living out of the fullness that we already have. The reality is there is no difference to cover. There's only fullness to live out of. But that mystic was right. We often do play the part of the fish swimming in search of water or the bird at flight searching for air. Christ is nearer to us 
than the air that fills our lungs, than the joyful memories that envelop our minds, than the love that floods our hearts, than the gravity that binds us to this earth. Christ is nearer to us than the soul is to the body, than the heart is to the rhythm of its beating. Now, I don't say this as feel-good fluff, asking everybody to gleefully and naively embrace the celebration of Easter. When the reality is, if we're honest, most of us still feel like we're thoroughly stuck in the thick of Good Friday because of our current global situation, and rightfully so. It is important for us to remember that Christ is not just the risen one, but that he is the crucified and risen one. And just as we're not meant to be strangers to any of Jesus' joy, Jesus has never been a stranger to any of our pain, even now. Christ is nearer to us than a tear is to the face that it streams down. Christ is nearer to us than heartache is to the heart that's broken. Christ is nearer to us than the final breath is to the person who breathes it. And yet, we mustn't miss the whole point of the gospel lesson today. At some point, we actually have to get to the end of the road. We have to get to Emmaus. At some point, we have to acknowledge that neither Jesus' story nor ours ends with Good Friday. While it is true that Jesus has fully taken every single iota of your pain upon himself, it is equally as true that there's never a point where the stone has not already been fully rolled away from your tomb. If Christ is no longer in his grave, my friends, neither are you. Now, this is usually the point in the sermon where the preacher says something rousing and uplifting, calling everybody dramatically into action. But I find that that's the beautiful thing about the gospel story this week and Easter. There's nothing left to be done. It is finished. The gift of grace could not be any more given than it already is. Jesus couldn't be any more present to us than he already is. Jesus journeys with us whether we recognize it or not. And while we can invite him in to stay with us, like the two disciples, Jesus teaches us in the story this morning that there's never been a time where he's not already been staying with us, abiding under our roof. And this preacher could tell you to get up and to go out there and to be Christ to the world. But this would imply that this isn't already the case. The good news of the gospel is that you couldn't be any more in Christ than you are right now, in this moment, and in every single moment. So the call of the gospel story today is not to go and to do, but the call of the gospel story today is to rest in what Jesus has already done, to simply just let it be and let yourself be in it. Remember, the disciples did not recognize the risen Christ until they rested from their journey. We would be wise to rest in Jesus' resting in us before we decide to journey any further into our own stories. In fact, in fact, resting in Jesus' resting in us that is the journey. Let us profess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, 
of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Filled with joy on this royal feast of feasts, let us offer prayers to God who leads his sons and daughters through the Red Sea waters. Our response today to Risen Lord is, hear our prayer. For the Holy Churches of God, Stephen our Bishop, the Presbyters and Deacons, our new brothers and sisters, this holy gathering and all the holy people of God, Risen Lord, hear our prayer. For the world and its leaders, our nation and its people, Risen Lord, hear our prayer. For all those in need, the suffering and the oppressed, travelers and prisoners, the dying and the dead, risen Lord, hear our prayer. For ourselves, our families, and those we love, risen Lord, hear our prayer. That our Savior may grant us triumph over our visible and invisible enemies. Risen Lord, hear our prayer. That with Christ we may crush beneath our feet the Prince of Darkness and all evil powers. Risen Lord, hear our prayer. That Christ may fill us with the joy and happiness of his holy resurrection. Risen Lord, hear our prayer that we may enter the chamber of the divine wedding feast and rejoice without limit with the angels and saints. Risen Lord, hear our prayer. Remembering our most glorious and blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints, let us offer ourselves and one another to the living God through Christ. Risen Lord, hear our prayer. We will now hold a silence together in which you are invited to lift up the needs and concerns that carry that you carry in your heart today. If you are gathered with others of your household, you might speak your prayers aloud to one another. You are also welcome to share prayer requests in the chat on our Facebook or YouTube pages so that others there can see your request and join you in prayer. Please do not share the last names or personal details. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, for the victory over death of your Son, Jesus Christ. Hear the prayers we offer this holy day and grant that we who have received new life and baptism may live forever in the joy of the resurrection through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we also pray, we turn to you, O Lord, in full knowledge of our frailty, our vulnerability, and our great need as your mortal creatures. We cry to you as one human family, unsure of the path ahead, unequal to the unseen forces around us, frightened by the sickness and death that seem all too real to us now. 
Stir up your strength and visit us, O Lord. Be our shield and rock and hiding place. Guide our leaders, our scientists, our nurses and doctors. Give them wisdom and fill their hearts with courage and determination. Make even this hour, O Lord, a season of blessing for us, that in fear we find you mighty to save, and in our weakness we trust the cross to be none other than the way of life. All this we ask in the name of the one who bore all our infirmities, Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. And in the words that our Savior taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing, mercy, and grace of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>